Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? Glad to see that you were able to make it here on, uh, it's almost like the first day of winter outside. Uh, you know, what happened to, f it's fall, y'all. Well, I'm glad to see that you're here. It looks like we might have just a little bit of wet weather here in this afternoon, uh, about the time we get out of church. Uh, we're going to start in the book of uh, Judges in uh, chapter number 3, right around about verse number 12. But we're going to start off here first with a word of prayer, and then I have something else that I'd like to discuss here for just a brief minute before we get into the message. But if you would, bow your heads with me, and we will start this with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you for the grace that you have provided to each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you for this nation where we have the ability to gather in your name. And Lord, we have the ability to speak openly about you. And Lord, we just thank you for the grace that you've given to each and every one of us. Lord, I ask that you would allow me to be the voice this morning, that you would take me away from it. And as John has said, man, I'm a man of unclean lips. So Lord, just allow the words that come out to be yours. Lord, we ask that you would bless the service to follow and that you would just allow each and every one that hears the message today, Lord, to, to have a blessing. And we ask all of these things in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord put something on my heart this morning as we were coming on in. So I want to go ahead and, and kind of address that first. Because we're getting close to the, uh, to the holiday season. One of the most important and one of the most precious things that we each and every one of us have is time. And the Lord kind of put that on my heart this morning to kind of give you a, a, a small message about time. It is probably one of the rarest commodities that a person has. And we can either spend it wisely or we can spend it foolishly. We can take somebody else's time and, or we can give of our own. And what we have in that little bit amount of time that we have in this life is the time that we can give to our Lord and Savior. You guys are doing that this morning by being here in church, and I do not want to waste, be wasteful of your time, but I just want to be a reminder that time spent in fellowship with God is never wasted. We have a lot of relatives that, that we think about at this time of year as we go into the holiday season. And every time that you make a phone call, you are giving of yourself and your time to that person that you're calling. When they answer, you're taking up their time, but you're allowing them to know that you are thinking of them. So it's not a wasted effort. A lot of times during this time of year, there are a lot of people that are shut in. There are a lot of people that aren't able to get out. And sometimes we need to take that into account and think of them in our busy day and take a little bit of our time in order to talk with them, in order to be with them, and in order to encourage them. And I just, the Lord kind of laid that on my heart here that we, we think of others even though we have such precious little time of our own, but that through that giving of our time to others, we are in order to sacrifice for the Lord, and as long as we do it with his blessing and his willingness, nothing but good things can come from it. So now if you would, turn to uh, verse 13 of Judges chapter number 3, and we'll see that we're getting to the second judge of Israel, Ehud. And it says in verse number, I'm going to start in verse number 12, and it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And he gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and went and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. Now, for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with the history of the area, the city of palm trees is the city of Jericho. 
Sometimes, you know, I have to take a look and, and do some research in order to find out about some of the places and some of the things here because they're always talked about in different aspects or different things, and we never really know what geographic area we're talking about unless we do a little research. So the city of palm trees is the city of Jericho, which is the first city that the nation of Israel captured when they went into the promised land. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised them up a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, a Benjamite, a man left-handed, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, the king of Moab. So here they're being very specific about a characteristic of, of Ehud, because it's not very often that you have somebody that's left-handed. But the king knew that he was left-handed. The people of Israel knew that he was left-handed because it was, very, it was an uncommon trait. But he had made him a dagger which had two edges of a cubit length, and he did gird it under his raiment upon his right thigh. So if he is left-handed, normally you would have your weapon on your right side. Now, a cubit is basically from about the tip of your finger to your elbow. So that's a pretty big dagger to make from handle to tip. And it's, so it's something that's not small, but it's not real large either. And he hit it on his right side. Uh, let's see here in verse 17, and it says, And he brought the present unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man. And he must have been for the way that it is described here in a couple of passages about what happens to him and what happens to this dagger. So he, we have to remember that during this time frame, that somebody that had great girth was somebody that was very opulent and had a lot of things with them. Because during the, that time frame, most people that were poor were not large people. And it says in verse number 19, but he himself turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king, who said, Keep silence. And all that stood by him went out from him. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee. And he arose out of his seat. And he had put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. And the haft also went in after the blade and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of the belly and the dirk came out. So we're talking about a dagger about this big. And he shoves this thing into this gentleman's midsection and it didn't come out the back, and the fat came around it and held it in place so that he could not remove it. So now it is stuck within the king that he has just slain. And he's in his private chamber all by himself with this king, and the king never cried out. So it makes you kind of wonder what took place, how did he keep the king silent in order to shove this dagger within him and do that. Now, I spent 24 years in the military. Most of you know that. So I think strategically along some of these things about how these things happen. So he has this dagger on the right side and he's left-handed. How is it that he's going to get this thing out and be able to use it? Well, he must have had the dagger with the hilt at the bottom and the tip at the top. Because that would be the only way that he would be able to reach underneath what he had for clothing at that time and pull it straight out. 
he had to use his right hand in order to keep the king silent, which is not his strong hand, which is not his dominant hand. All of these things he had to take into consideration in order to do what he had done here. And it says in 23 that Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor upon him and locked them. And when he was gone out, his servants came. And when they saw that, be, that they went, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked. They said, surely he covereth his feet in his summer chamber. Now, I'm not sure if you guys understand what this is talking about here where he covers his feet in the summer chamber. What they're saying is, oh, the king has decided to take an afternoon siesta, for those of you that understand the term, they took a nap in this chamber because it's a cool chamber for the summertime. So they weren't going to disturb him in his slumber because they thought that he was sleeping they didn't realize that he had been slain. And this gives Ehud a lot of time in order to get out of the palace and to get to the place where he needed to be. And they tarried till they were ashamed. And behold, he opened not the doors of the parlor. Therefore they took a key and opened them. And behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. So... It was a long time before they got to the point where it was, do I disturb the king or not? You guys have probably had jobs where, you know, people are behind closed doors, they're working on things, something comes up, and you debate on whether or not, should I knock on the door? Should I open that door? Should I go in? Should I talk with them? At what point do I get to the point where, I feel it is now an emergency that I go ahead and then I interrupt what is taking place. That's basically how these servants are right now. They're going, do I disturb the king or not? Well, if I disturb the king, what's going to happen to me? They have that internal clock going, well, you know, the king should be doing this. And they always postpone and wait. This is what allows Ehud to go. And Ehud escaped, in verse 26, while they tarried and passed beyond the quarries and escaped from Seirath. And it came to pass, when he was come, that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before them. And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went down after him and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty and all men of valor, and they escaped not a man. So, because Ehud was a man of God, where the nation of Israel had done things that caused them to be out of God's favor. They had cried out to God. God brought Ehud up in order to allow them in, to get back in with God. You know, they had to have a judge. So he is the second one. And here it talks about the men that they slew. These are not just ordinary guys. It is that they are very strong. And they are men of valor, which in the book, in the Bible, when it says men of valor, they are warriors. They are the top of the top of this particular um, nation, Moab. And because their king had been slain, they were in disarray. Whenever you have an army and you take out the leadership of that army, that army becomes confused becomes more able to be overtaken because they do not have the lines of communication. They don't know who's in charge anymore and they don't know who's going to be able to make decisions. Without the king, these men of valor were more easily overcome. So in verse number 30, it says, So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. 
and the land had rest fourscore years. So under Ehud, the nation of Israel had peace for 80 years. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anata, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Now it doesn't really talk a whole lot about the third judge here, Shamgar, in this particular area, but he is the third judge. And it was after the 80 years that he ended up uh, fighting the Philistines. And then we get to the fourth judge. And it says in chapter number four, and the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin king of Canaan that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Caesarea, which dwelt in Harseth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. So every time that the children of Israel get out of favor with the Lord because they follow after either other gods or after other nations, they get oppressed. And then the Lord has to come and take care of them once they get to the point where it's like, well, hey, Lord, we're, we're back. We're following you again, and we are oppressed. So for 20 years, they had the oppression, and then the Lord raised up Deborah. A prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinom, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor? Even though she's a judge, and even though she has a place here within the nation of Israel, she's not a warrior. So she has to have a warrior to come and do the bidding because the Lord is going to use Barak in order to deliver the nation of Israel. And in verse number 7, it says, And I will draw thee unto the river Kishon Caesarea, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor, for the Lord shall sell Caesarea into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. So here is this mighty man, Barak. And he's got a mandate from the Lord to go do this. But he's still a little afraid. He wants a little comfort. He wants somebody there with him that he knows has the ear of the Lord. So he says to Deborah, listen, I'll go under the condition that you go with me because I know in my head and in my heart that if you go with me, the Lord will be with us because you are a judge of Israel. It has been demonstrated in that that is how things took place. And in verse number 10, it says, And Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet. And Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had served himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent unto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh, 
and they showed Caesarea that Barak the son of Abinom was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Caesarea gathered together his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harshareth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. So he is now in pursuit. He's going, hey, they did this, I'm going after them. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Caesarea into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. And the Lord discomfited Caesarea and all his chariots and all his host. So I'll stop right there. When the Lord is with you, there is none that can stand against you. We as Christians... We have to remember this. We have to stand, and we have to allow the Lord to be with us. When you get that small inkling in the back of your mind that says, I should do this, it's probably the Holy Spirit trying to get you to go and do something for him. We have those things, I know I do anyway, that tells me, hey, I need to go talk to somebody. I need to go do something. And I need to follow that. And I need to follow through with it. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're like Barak here, where the Lord is saying, go and I will go before you. Because if the Lord is telling you to do something, he's already made the way open and clear for you to go through and do that. All you have to do is step out on faith and discuss him with whomever it is that he has put on your heart. Whether that's a relative, whether that's somebody you work with, whether that's somebody that's sitting at the next gas pump. Sometimes the Lord uses us in, in ways that we don't even realize and we'll never realize until we get to heaven. And it says that here, with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Caesarea lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Now, he's the one who has the major armament here. He's got the chariots, yet the Lord confused him so much and did so many different things before Barak did anything and came down there to start slowing that he got out of his chariot and he ran away by foot rather than using the chariot which he had to flee on. And it says, But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harsareth of the Gentiles, and all the hosts of Caesarea fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left except for Caesarea. So it says, Howbeit Caesarea fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazar and the house of Heber the Kenite. So he thought that he was going to be safe going to, to this person's tent. That he was going to be able to get away. That they were going to be able to hide him and keep him from Barak. But remember earlier that Deborah said that he would be delivered into the hand of a woman. It wasn't Deborah's hand that he was to be delivered into. But here, this woman's hand. And it says in verse number 18, And Jael went out to meet Caesarea and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. So there's a lot of things that are going to go on here to get to the point before he is basically docile enough for her to do what she is going to do. And again he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee, and say, Is there any man here that thou shalt say no? Then Jael Huber's wife took a nail 
of the tent and took a hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. So basically, he's laying on the ground and she put a spike through his temple into the ground. The Lord delivered him into her hands for the nation of Israel. And all of this was discussed by Deborah. She didn't claim how it was going to take place. She just claimed that he was going to be delivered into the hands of a woman. And in verse number 22, it says, And behold, as Barak pursued Caesarea, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, behold, Caesarea lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Cana, before the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they were, had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. In chapter number five, it's the song of Deborah and Barak. Now, Hebrew poetry or Hebrew songs can be sometimes a little difficult to go through. I'm not sure exactly why, but the, how the wording is doesn't sometimes jive with, with songs or music the way I would think of songs and music, but it is here. And it says, The song of Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinom, on that day, saying, Praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Here's a key. With your relationship with the Lord, just like the Israel's relationship with the Lord, you have to be willing to offer yourself to the Lord. It means you have to be willing to follow. You have to be willing to understand what the Lord has for you and be willing to accept it. There are a lot of people in the world today that are not willing to accept the Lord. They're not willing to accept what he has for them. They think that they know best and have a better way. We know that anything that the Lord has for us is good. Anything that the world has without the Lord is nothing. It says, Hear, O ye kings, give ear, or ye princes. I, even I, will sing unto the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, and the heavens dropped, the clouds also dropped water. So it was raining. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even into Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. In the day of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, or Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. Uh, the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or a spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? Verses 7 and 8 kind of describe the condition of Israel before Deborah came with the judgment that God had given her. It is said in verse number 9, My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Because back in verses 7 and 8, they were talking about little gods. They were talking about those idols and being idol worshiping. And that Israel had gotten itself into idol worship and that they had turned their back or they had forgotten the Lord God, their Savior. 
And then during the 20 years of persecution that always seems to be, you know, the correction that God uses is the nations in order to keep them and teach the nation of Israel how to fight and how to keep up and how to do war, that they ended up having to cry out to the Lord in order to be saved again. So here in verse number 9, those that were in charge of Israel, they found themselves back praising the Lord God. And in verse number 10, it says, Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. These are the rulers. For those that were on white or basically a roan-colored animal, because it was a sign of leadership. It was a sign of authority. It's just like us with our cowboy movies. I'm sure that most of you are old enough to remember the Lone Ranger, always on a white horse. Or the, or the Westerns, the man with the white hat, always to stand for purity, always to stand for right, always to stand for what is true. That's what this passage here is, to, is discussing. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts towards the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Awake, awake. Deborah, awake. Awake, utter a song, raise Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinam. So basically, hey, awake, awake, rise up. Hey, it's time for you to, to come back to me. It is time for you to understand what the Lord your God has for you. It is time for you to put away idols. It is time for you to put away false gods. It is time for you to put away false narratives and to come back to the Lord thy God. When you get saved, it's an awakening. And that you can equate to here. The nation of Israel had gone away from the Lord their God. So it was, hey, awake, come back. Arise, allow the Lord in your life. Follow the commandments of God. And it says, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead the captivity captive, thou son of Abinom. That is, take charge, take command, and fight. Take captivity captive. So take your captors and become the captors of your captives. And in verse 13, it says, Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim was there a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among thy people, out of Mature came down governors, and out of Zebulon, they that handle the pen of the writer. So the Amaleks, these are the sworn enemies of, of the Jews have been since they left the land of Egypt. And they're always there, always fighting against the Jewish people. And they had rulers to come out of the different portions of the tribes of, Egypt, uh, of Israel. So governors from Zebulon, and they that handle the pen, or, or the scribes in this case, to write. And the prince of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley for the division of Reuben. There were great thoughts of heart. Judges, we have judges. We don't have rulers, we have judges. Judges make decisions. Judges weigh in the balance between things. 
The nation of Israel has had four judges so far. They weigh in the balance the things that are taking place within the nation of Israel. And they try to make judgments based off of what the Lord is telling them. They're almost prophets where the Lord talks to them and tells them what needs to be done. We, in our time, we have this. This is our prophet. This is our word. This is our instruction. This is our truth. Yes, brother. For those of you that may not have heard uh, Brother Hugh, he was talking about trust and obey and about giving good news as well as giving bad news. Everybody likes to hear good news, but nobody likes to hear bad news. And the world is unwilling to hear good news. So all they have is bad news. The gospel, another word for good news. Sometimes the hardest thing in life is to tell somebody something they don't want to hear. And the nation of Israel, whenever they would lose one of their judges, they would go away from the Lord. They would have to have correction. They didn't want to hear the bad news that things are going to take place, that things are going to cause them to be corrected, because nobody likes correction until after it's over. And you realize that it was something that you needed. If you would, bow your heads with me, and we'll close in a word of prayer here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the book of Judges. It's kind of a hard book to go through in our time here for us to understand, for us to discuss, and for us to learn from. But there are many lessons here. There are many lessons for us. And Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your opportunity here in your house for us to hear them. Lord, I thank you for the words that you've given to me, Lord, because they're not mine, they're yours. And Lord, we ask that you would watch over the nation of Israel, which is your chosen people, we know that they're not done yet, that they haven't fulfilled the mandate that you have for them, and that they are a people that are constantly at warfare because of your choosing. You're choosing them as your people, and that the world who hates you will also hate them. Lord, we ask you to help uplift our nation and allow us to be a nation that fully supports Israel. We ask that you would be with those people that are in war. We ask you to be with those service members that are away from their families here today. And Lord, we just thank you for this church, and we ask that you would be with this church as well. In your name we pray, amen.